Father in heaven, we thank you for all of our, with all of our hearts for the word of God. We thank you for the promises in God's word. We thank you that you are a promise maker and a promise keeper. In the desperation of our lives, help us cling to your promises. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sickness is debilitating not only to the body, but it's also debilitating to our minds. Have you ever noticed that when you get sick, you often feel discouraged, you feel depressed? You've been sick for a week and you feel really down. Have, but have you ever been sick for more than a week? Have you ever been sick for two weeks? Or how do you feel when you're sick for three weeks? Uh, recently, the world has gone through the COVID-19 pandemic. And many of those infected with the disease reported overwhelming physical symptoms and also mental symptoms. Some had sore throats. Others had fever. In one moment they had fever, in the next moment they're shaking from head to toe and they're cold. Many people had difficulty breathing. Some of them were put on breathing machines. Others were intubated. And one of the big challenges is that when these folk went into the hospital, their relatives couldn't visit them. So they also had not only the, the fever, the headache, the shaking with the chills, the breathing machines, but they also had this intense loneliness, this sense of separation from loved ones, this sense that they just needed the loving touch and somebody to reach out to them. It's incredibly difficult to suffer in the advanced stages of coronavirus for weeks and months. But what if you suffered with a disease for 12 long years? In our Bible study this evening, we're going to talk about how God, in that 12-year period, ministered and led a woman who eventually, who eventually, found salvation in Christ. This woman suffered for 12 long years. Her story is recorded in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. And when a story is recorded in those three Gospels, it must be incredibly important. For 12 long years, she was hemorrhaged. The blood never stopped flowing. In those days, if you were a woman with that issue of blood, you were considered to be unclean. She had to leave her family. No longer could her husband embrace her. No longer could her children jump up on her lap. No longer could she feel the warm embrace of a brother or sister. She wandered the streets for 12 long years. Dusty, dirty clothing, blood-stained garments, she looked for help in every direction, but seemed not to be able to find it. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record her story because it's so incredibly important. But in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, the chapters record nine miracles. These nine miracles are mentioned in series of three. Now, the importance of these nine miracles help us to understand the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And they help us to understand Jesus, the promise maker and the promise keeper. These three miracles are in, these nine miracles are in sequences of three. The first three miracles are the miracle of Christ in Matthew chapter 8, healing the leper. Then the, the miracle of Jesus healing the servant of a centurion, and then Jesus healing the mother-in-law of Peter. What do these three miracles tell us about Jesus the promise maker, Jesus the promise keeper, Jesus the miracle worker? Who was this leper? Who was he? The leper was an outcast. He was margin, he was on the outskirts of society, the, the outlying of society. He had to walk through society saying, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. The leper was an outcast. What about the centurion? He was an enemy. 
uh, Romans were hated by the Jews. He was an enemy. What about the mother-in-law of Peter? She was marginalized. Women had no status. So you have an outcast, an enemy, and one that has no status. What is this saying? It is saying that Christ, who is the embodiment of love, comes to earth to reach out to those who are outcasts, to reach out to those who are enemies, to reach out to those who are marginalized. Then you have the next three miracles. The next three miracles, Jesus calms the storm. There's a disaster. The disciples can no longer cope with the storm. The wind blows, the thunder rolls, the lightning flashes, the waves come up and hit the boat. And the disciples say, Lord, don't you care we're perishing here? But Jesus says, peace be still. He is the miracle worker, but the promise keeper that he'll bring peace. He calms the storm, disaster. The second miracle in this three is Jesus delivers the demoniac. He is the miracle worker, but he's the promise keeper. He can deliver from demons. Third miracle, Jesus heals one riddled with disease who's let down through the roof, a man shaking from head to toe with a palsy. What do these three miracles tell us? They tell us when we're facing our worst disaster from without, like that storm, when our little boat is going through the sea of life and the waves are overwhelming it. Jesus is Lord over every disaster. When demons torment us from within, when the temptations are so great that we cannot cope with them, Jesus is the promise keeper. He says, no temptation will take in given to you but is common to man. God is faithful who will allow you to have victory over every temptation. You see, Jesus makes promises, but Jesus keeps promises. He delivers us from, from the demonic forces that try to pull us down. And Jesus is Lord over disease. So in these three parables, three miracles, Jesus is Lord over disaster. Jesus is Lord over demons. Jesus is Lord over death. He keeps his promises. When Christ died on the cross, he defeated the principalities and powers of hell. So we can go forth victorious in Jesus' name. I love this statement from the book Steps to Christ. It says, no calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety can harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our heavenly father is un observant, or in which he takes no immediate interest. He heals the broken in heart and binds up the wounds, Psalm 147.3. That's an amazing promise, isn't it? He heals the broken in heart. He binds up the wounds. Next sentence is absolutely critical. The relations between God and each soul are as full and distinct as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for which he gave his beloved son. But somebody says, Pastor Mark, that, that statement is just mind boggling. The relations between God and each soul are as full and distinct as if there were not another soul on earth. And the question is, Pastor Mark, how can that be so? More than 7 billion people living on planet earth clawing at one another for living space. Would Jesus even know if I was lost? I mean, he has seven billion others. Well, how would he know if I were lost? Let's suppose, and we're just supposing, and this is the preacher's imagination, of course. Let's suppose that here's a mother with five children. How many of you have, have more than one child? Just lift up your hand. Uh, how many of you have more than two children? Lift up. How many have more than five children? What about 10? No, that we won't go there. Let's suppose that you have five children. And let's suppose one of those children tragically dies. So your pastor invites me to come and counsel with you. So I begin to counsel this way. Now look, look, sister, you, you shouldn't worry about that because you have four children. Some people only have one, so be thankful you have four. And I was thinking about it too, when you make that homemade apple pie. Now everybody gets 20% more. 
because that one child won't, won't eat that other pie. And think about when you have to buy clothes. You now don't have to buy five pairs of shoes, you only have to buy four. And think about when you go on vacations. Think about all the money you're going to save. What do mothers say to crazy preachers who try to convince them that way not to grieve? Well, they probably throw them out of the house, right? I think what they'd say is this. Nobody can take the place of Johnny. Nobody can take the place of Mary. I think they would say, nobody can love me like her. Nobody can hug me like her. You see, the love of four children doesn't make up for the love of the one that died. There's an emptiness in that mother's heart. There is a longing in that mother's heart. And what is that longing for? That longing is for the one she doesn't have. Who put it in a mother's heart to love five? Jesus. And the Jesus that put it in a mother's heart to love five can love five billion, can love six billion, can love seven billion, because he has an infinite capacity to love. And so when Jesus came to earth, and when the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but in the world that in him it, they should have life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The love of God for all of humanity has a place just for you. Just like that mother's heart had a place for five and four would never take the place of the one that was lost. No other person can take your place. When God created you, he created you neat, you, you unique, special in the entire universe. There's nobody else like you in the universe. That's why Steps to Christ can say the relations between God and each soul are as full and distinct as if there were not another soul upon the earth. That's what these miracles tell us. The miracle of Jesus calming the storm tells us that Jesus cares. The miracle of Christ delivering the demoniacs tells us that Jesus cares. The miracle of Christ healing the man with palsy tells us that Jesus cares. It tells us that the promises in the Bible of his care and his love are for you and for me. But that leads us to the next three miracles, and particularly our miracle that we want to focus on in our study today. In the last three miracles, we find Jesus healing two women. We find Jesus healing two blind men, and Jesus healing one with an impaired speech who was a mute. He couldn't talk. What do these miracles tell us? They're a little bit different. The first three miracles, now remember there are nine miracles in Matthew 8 and 9. The first three miracles tell us of Christ's care, his love, his, his reaching out, his promise that all humanity matters to him. The second three miracles tell us about Christ's power, his power over disaster, his power over demons, his power over disease. These three miracles, if you look at them carefully, Everyone, tell, everyone tells us that it is only as we reach up by faith to grasp the promises of God that they become reality in our life. You can have all the promises in the Bible. Like the old song says, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. You can have all the promises in the Bible, but if you do not grasp them by faith, if you do not accept what God says by faith, they will do you very, very little difference. So these three stories are stories of faith. The theme of these miracles is the power of life-giving, life-changing, life-transforming faith. Let's study this first one of these stories. The story of the woman with the issue of blood. And suddenly, the Bible says, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. She says, only if I could touch the hem of his garment. She has suffered. Now, the Gospel of Mark adds in Mark 5, verse 25 and 26, that she had suffered many things from physicians. So here's a woman that wanders for 12 years. She's desperate. She's discouraged. Garments are dirty. She has to shout, unclean, 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 as she walks through the crowd. The crowd separates. They don't want nothing to do with this woman, with their blood-stained garments, with the hemorrhage of blood. 
She gets word that there's a physician over here. She goes to him, spends her money. And the Bible says, Mark's gospel says, she just gets worse. Another physician, she goes there, just gets worse. 12 long years, she walks through that dark valley. 12 long years, she's isolated. She's alone, but she hears of Jesus. She hears of the one who can touch her and make her whole. She hears of the one that's touched the eyes of the blind and they were open, touched the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped. She hears of the one that healed the withered arm and healed the palsied legs. And she says, maybe, maybe, just maybe, there is hope for me. She was not only desperate, but she was hopeless. She was not only discouraged, but she was in total despair. But she hears about Jesus. She hears about the one who is the epitome of health. She hears about the one who came, John 10, verse 10, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. So she hears about the one who can give her abundant life. She comes. And as she comes, she sees this large crowd around Jesus. But as she's coming to Jesus, Jesus sees her out of the corner of his eye. And he begins moving the crowd toward her before she ever began to approach him. Before she ever met the master, Jesus was moving toward her. Mark's gospel reveals the, her desperation in these words. If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. You know, just think of that, the, that expression. Here's this desperate woman, suffered 12 years. She's hopeless. And she says, if only, if only I could touch the hem of his garment. But he's inching the crowd toward her. And before she ever came to him, Jesus was her last and only hope for help. If he could not help her, she was doomed to a life of constant pain and continual sickness. Notice what Ellen White says. As he was passing, she reached forward and succeeded in barely touching what the border of his garment. That moment she knew she was healed. In that one touch was concentrated the faith of her life. And instantly her pain and feebleness disappeared. Instantly, she felt the thrill of the electric current passing through the, every fiber of her being. There came over her a sensation of perfect health. Can you almost see her reaching through the crowd? Can you almost see the, the look on her face of saying, I know that this man can help me. She touches the hem of his garment. And like an electric current, healing flows through her body. And she knows she is healed. Who was drawing her to Jesus all that time? As she saw him there, who was drawing her before she ever knew it or recognized it? What was actually taking place was the Holy Spirit was drawing this poor, helpless woman to Jesus. Now, you have not turned on this three angels broadcasting program, camp meeting by accident. The Holy Spirit has drawn you. There's a blessing for you in this program. The Spirit of God wants to touch you. He wants you to know that the promises of God's word are yours. He wants you to know that the Christ that touched the blind eyes and they're open can open your blind eyes and you can see eternal realities, that he can touch your deaf ears. And as he can do that, your ears will open to the divine truth of God's word. He wants you to know today that he is there by your side. He wants you to know that the promises of the Bible are for you, that just as he cared for the enemy, the Roman centurion, just as he cared for the outcast, the leper, just as he cared for Peter's mother-in-law, who was considered of no status in society, just as he cared for them, whoever you are, wherever you are, he cares for you. Just as his power calmed the storm, his power can calm the storms in your life. Just as Jesus delivered from the demoniacs, he can deliver you. Just as he touched that person with disease, he can touch your body today. And just as he brought faith into this woman's heart and gave her hope when she was hopeless for 20 years, he can give you hope. He, he is the Christ of hope. We reach out to him and touch him by faith. But somebody says, that's my problem, Pastor Mark. I don't have any faith. I've got good news for you. Romans 12, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. The Bible talks about faith 
And uh, it says this, Romans 12, verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God, no, don't miss this, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So when we come to Christ and we open our hearts to Jesus, what does he give to us? A measure of faith. Faith is a gift that comes from God. And it is a gift given to us by God. So faith is not something we work up. It's not saying, you know what? I got to work harder so I have more faith. It's rather opening our hearts and saying, Jesus, I am your child. I am your son. I'm your daughter. I've surrendered my life to you and you have given me faith. Now, you remember where the Bible says, if you have faith as the grain of mustard seed, what's mustard seed like? I could probably put three, 400 mustard seeds on my thumb. Mustard seeds are the smallest number of seeds. And Jesus said, if you have faith as the grain of mustard seed, you can say to that mountain over there, move, and it's going to move. What's he talking about? Does that mean I can go out by the Rocky Mountains and I have faith and I just say, move mountain, the Rockies move? Maybe this illustration will help you. When I was a boy, we lived in Norwich, Connecticut, on the east coast of America, on Perkins Avenue. We lived on the top of a hill. And when I came home from playing sports, had my gym bag with me, or if I had to walk that way home from school with my backpack on, I would walk up that hill. You know, I walked 10 steps. Whew, what a hill. Walk 10 steps more. Whew, what a hill. Sometimes I feel, man, I got to sit down. I can't walk up this hill. And so throughout my life, I thought, man, we lived on this great big hill. I'd walk up it as a little boy, and whew, I'd be breathing and breathing. I went back to that with, as an adult with my wife to show her the big hill. And I came there. Where's, where's that hill? Where's that hill? It was a little tiny hill. Why did the hill seem so big when I was a little boy? The smaller I was, the bigger the hill became. The bigger I became, the smaller the hill became. What's that have to do with faith? When you have little faith, every problem you have seems big. It seems like a great big mountain. But when you have large faith and you grasp the promises of God, the mountains move because they're no longer there anymore. Why? Because God's bigger than the mountain. God's greater than the challenges. You know that when you face a mountain and you grasp the promises of God, no matter how little your faith is, when it attaches itself to the promises of God, your faith grows and those promises that God has given to you in the Bible move that mountain. And so when you, whatever problem you have, maybe your mountain is a financial burden. Maybe your mountain is a health burden. Maybe it's a relationship problem or a marriage problem. Maybe that's your mountain. But when you grasp the promises of God by faith, he's either going to take you over that mountain, he's going to take you around that mountain, he's going to move the mountain away from you so that you can go through that, go right through, or you're going to dig in your mountain and find gold. Grasping the promises of God by faith makes all the difference. That woman reached out by faith, all the concentrated faith of her life. She touched the hem of Christ's garment. She believed in the promises of God. She believed that he was a healer. She believed that he was a miracle worker. She believed he could deliver her. And as she felt that healing power, Jesus says, who touched me? Who touched me? The disciples said, wait a minute. Well, what are you saying who touched me for? And people are jostling you in the crowd. Jesus picked that woman out of the crowd. And look what Jesus says. Jesus makes this remarkable statement to the woman. Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Jesus calls her daughter. She's not some woman that's unclean. She's not some woman that um, has some blood-tinged garments that she has to shout, get out of the way, here I come. Jesus says, daughter. Nobody has called her that. Jesus, the divine son of God, says, daughter, 
In other words, you're valuable in my sight. You're precious in my sight. Accept my promises and I am going to work a miracle in your life. And Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Her faith grasped the promises of God. Her faith grasped the reality of Jesus' power. And as her faith grasped that, he said, you're well. That word well is an amazing word in the Bible. In the Greek language of the New Testament is zozo. And zozo has to do with total wellness, total wholeness. You're emotionally well. You're mentally well. You are physically well. You are spiritually well. Jesus said, I've restored you to the dignity that you lost with your disease. I've restored to you, to your womanhood. Jesus said, in me, you are whole. The brokenness of the past is gone. And Christ says that to you tonight. When our bodies are racked with sin, when we are broken and crushed because of the sins of life, and we reach out and believe the promises of God, and when Christ touches us with his healing grace, he heals that brokenness. He heals that hurt of the heart, and we become one in Jesus. What is faith? Faith is trusting God. Faith is believing what God says is true. It's believing his word. It's accepting his promises. It's acting upon what he says. Now, let me put it this way. Faith can be best illustrated in the life of Abraham. You find this in Romans chapter 4, verse 17. God speaks to Abraham in his old age, and he says, I've made you the father of many nations. Father of many nations? I'm 100 years old. I haven't seen the fulfillment of the promise. In the presence of him whom the beloved, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. What's that all about? How can God call things that do not exist as if they did exist? How can God do that? Uh, how can God say that something that doesn't exist does? Here's why God can say that. Because what God says is so, even if it were never so before. Why? Because God will make it so. The power of God's speech creates that which God declares. Whatever God declares is so because he has the power to create it. When God says to the deadness of Sarah's womb, there is life there, although there was no life there and Abraham was 100 years old, God can create life in Sarah's womb. The promises of God create life in us when by faith we grasp them. Faith is not about seeing, it's about believing. Faith is not even about understanding. It's about grasping God's promises when we don't understand. You see, I do not see, then believe. I believe, then I see. I do not understand, then, then grasp the promises of God. There are many things in life that I'm not gonna understand. There are many things in life that happen. Why is it that a young boy driving home from school, 17, committed Christian, is hit by a speeding drunk driver and the young boy is killed? Can you try to explain that? No. But you can still grasp the promise that God will give to that mother-father peace. Why is it that bombs drop? Why is it that missiles and rockets fly? Why is it that tanks rumble into cities? Why is it that thousands die in the devastating effects of war? Why is it that some child's legs are blown off as they step on a landmine? Nobody can explain that. Why is it that there are so many orphans in our world? We say, sure, it's because of the sin of the world. Yes, it's because of the brokenness of the world, certainly. It's because of the selfishness and the greed and the pride and the arrogance, yes. But why do bad things happen to good people? The more you try to explain it, the more confused at times you become. But there can be this peace that passes understanding. I don't have to understand everything with my head for my heart to grasp the promises of God in peace. So faith is not seeing. 
Faith is believing when I do not see. It's trusting what God says is true. It's believing what God says is true. Let's look at some of the promises of God. I want to make this very practical for you. And let's look at how those promises, as we grasp them, can change our lives. First promise is the promise of forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. Somebody says, but Pastor Mark, I've confessed my sins, but I still feel guilty. Bless your soul. Your feelings don't have anything to do with it. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to do what? To forgive our sins. When we grasp that promise by faith, he creates within us freedom from guilt, freedom from condemnation, peace, and forgiveness. So forgiveness is not some judicial legislative action in heaven merely where our sins are covered by the blood of Christ. They are. But forgiveness is something that happens in the life of the believer. Christ has promised to forgive me. I accept his promise by faith, and I am forgiven whether I feel forgiven or not. Take the promise of strength, Philippians chapter 4, and we look there at verse 13, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who does what? Strengthens me. I remember on one occasion, I was helping a lady quit smoking. She had been a Christian, drifted away from Christ, and um, began to smoke. And she was coming back to Jesus, and she wanted to quit. And, uh, but she didn't have the power to quit. And she kept saying to me, Mark, Pastor Mark, I don't have any power. I can't quit smoking. I don't have any power. I said, well, let's take the Bible. Let's grasp the promises of God. So we got her Bible out, read to her, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I said, would you like to claim that promise? Let's open the Bible. Let's kneel down. Whatever habit you have, Christ has the power. Is it alcohol? Is it tobacco? Is it drugs? Christ has the power. Is it lust? Is it pornography? Christ has the power. Whatever attitude of bitterness and anger, resentment in your mind, Christ has the power. So I talked to this lady about claiming the promises of God, and she said, Pastor Mark, I'm just too weak. Pastor Mark, I smoked for so many years, I don't think I could give it up. I said, do you have a pen? She said, yes. Do you have your Bible? Yes. She handed me the Bible. I said, look, I want you to write this in your Bible. I said, you take your Bible. I want you to write this. I can do all things through Christ except quit smoking who strengthens me. She said, Pastor Mark, I'm not writing that in my Bible. I said, then do you believe what Jesus says? She said, Pastor Mark, I believe it. I can do all things through who? Through your strength? No. Through your power? No. I can do all things through whom? Through Christ that strengthens me. Jesus promises also support that third promise in our list. Memorize these promises. Write them down. Claim the promises of God and watch the, watch the miracle working power of God in your life. My God shall supply some of your need. What does it say? Philippians 4 19. My God shall supply what? All of your need according to his riches in glory. What financial needs do you have? It doesn't say I'll supply all our wants. Grasp the promises of God. Believe the promises of God. God's promises, watch this are creative statements from God, the promise maker. And when you accept those creative statements by faith, God will work a miracle in your life because his promises never fail. He gives us the promise of peace. Isaiah 26, verse 3, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. If you fix your mind on all your problems, you fix your mind on all your troubles, you fix your mind on all your difficulties, you will not have peace. But if you keep your mind upon Christ, he is greater than the circumstances. He will give you peace. It's freedom from fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. Now, fear is an emotion. We cannot control the emotions. Like Billy Graham says, you can't, he made this amazing statement, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. In other words, I may have emotions of fear. If I'm crossing the street and some car is going to about hit me, I may be fearful. That fearful may prompt me, that fearfulness may prompt me to um, move more quickly out of the way of the car. So uh, fear is an emotion. But what this text is saying, perfect love does what? Casts out fear. 
So there may be the fearful emotion, but perfect love casts that out. Why? Because I know that God would never harm me. I know that I can put my life in his hands. I know whatever happens, he's going to be there to strengthen me. The sixth great promise that I want you to write down, there are many promises in the Bible, but these kind of cover the general areas, is that Christ is always with us and he'll never forsake us. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. Lying on a bed, dying of cancer, Jesus says, I'm with you. Going through the death of a child, Jesus says, I'm with you. Going through the poverty of losing a job and not being able to make payments, Jesus says, I'm with you. Going through the agony of, of famine, hunger, war, Jesus says, I'm with you. When you grasp the promise that Jesus is with you, it does not mean that Christ is going to solve every one of your problems, but what it does mean is he's going to give you the strength to cope with whatever you've got to deal with. And the last one I love is authority. J John chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, As many as received him, to them gave he the power or the authority to become the sons of God. So when I come to Christ and I accept Jesus, I have the authority or the right to become a son of God. And as a son of God, my life is in his hands and nobody can take my life out of his hands. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Grasp the promises of God's word and believe those promises. The promises of God's word have really inspired men and women down through the ages. Thousands of missionaries have gone out. They've faced uh, horrendous problems, but the promises of God's word have, have strengthened them. I think of Adoram Judson, great uh, missionary to Asia. And uh, once he was in Burma and he was in prison for his preaching and uh, in jail, he was with a lot of cynics and critics of Christianity and he lay there in prison. His feet are chained. He has 36 pounds, we're told, uh, in his writings, in his diary uh, of chains around him. He's chained to a pole. It's hot. He's sweating and it looks like he's going to die in prison. He's almost dehydrated. He hasn't drunk a lot of water. Uh, he's getting skinnier and skinnier because they don't give him good food. And uh, a skeptic next and looks over and he says, Pastor Judson, what are the prospects of the conversion of the heathen now? And Judson says, the prospects are just as bright as the promises of God. On one occasion, Judson's treasury had basically run out of money. He had no more money to finance. He had a large mission uh, team. He had no more money to finance his team, no more money to finance his ministry. And somebody said to him, Judson, how much do we have in the bank account? And here's his response. You're going to love this. He said, we have 27 cents and all the promises of God. 27 cents and all the promises of God. Trust the promises of God. When you trust the promises of God and you reach out to God by faith, like that woman, Jesus' healing power will flow into your life. In his loving mercy, Christ revealed his grace to this desperate, hopeless woman, and he made her well again. Jesus is the promise maker. Jesus is the promise keeper. You see, the devil wants to tear us down. The devil wants us to look at the problems, not the promises. Jesus wants us to look at the promises and not the problems. The devil wants to tear us down. Jesus wants to build us up. The devil wants us worried and tense and anxious and consumed with difficulties and challenges. The devil always wants us to see the challenge as bigger than God's power, to see the difficulty greater than God's strength, to see the problem larger than the ability of Christ as we grasp his promise through faith to move that mountain of difficulty. But Jesus wants us filled with joy, filled with peace, filled with contentment. Jesus wants us to be filled with purpose in our life. And he longs for us to be so filled with his joy that we sense that we, through Christ, have overcome the world. You see, Jesus longs for us to be physically healthy, to be mentally alert, to be emotionally stable and spiritually well. 
And as we come to Jesus with the promises of God, you know, there are over 3,000 promises in the word of God. As we come to Jesus with the promises of his word, grasping those promises by faith, the reality of those promises fills our lives. When Christ touches us with his healing grace, we long to touch others with the touch of Christ so they can be made whole. You see, Jesus invites us to come to him, to grasp his promises by faith so that our lives are changed, not simply for the sake of changing them, but so that we can go out by faith and touch others with his grace, touch others with his goodness. See, Jesus is the great problem solver. In the most challenging circumstances, he encourages our hearts. In the most challenging circumstances, he lifts our spirit. In the most challenging circumstances, he heals our brokenness. The promises of God are true. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about the promises of God and the strength of those promises, the power of those promises. And notice what he says about the very promises of God. Here we look in scripture. And uh, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, but in him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom. When we are struggling, Jesus is our wisdom. He became for us righteousness. When we are struggling and we grasp the promises of God in all of our weakness and sin, his righteousness flows into our life. When we are struggling, he is our sanctification. What does this mean? That he changes us. He takes us from the depths of despair. He lifts us to the delights of discipleship. When we're struggling, he becomes our redemption. When you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it reinforces this idea of Jesus, the one who is the great promise maker and the great promise keeper. The, remember, a promise is only as good as the one who is behind the promise. And here's what scripture says about the promises of God. You don't want to miss this. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Remember, Jesus is the great problem solver. In the most challenging circumstances, he encourages our hearts. He lifts our spirits. He hides our brokenness. Listen to this, this about the promises of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, by Silvanus, by Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. Notice next verse. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him are men to the glory of God through us. Notice all the promises of God are what? What does it say? All the promises of God are yes. Jesus does not say no when you grasp his promises. He says yes when you grasp the promise of forgiveness. All the promises of God are what? They are yes and amen. Notice. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has sealed us and given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a deposit. So God gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us out by faith to grasp the promises of God. And as we grasp those promises, all of his promises are yes. All of his promises are amen. Some time ago, I was helping another man quit smoking. And as I was helping him grasp the promises of God, I read to him the promises of God, read to him 1 John chapter 5 here. And uh, Jesus speaks, and here is a tremendous mighty promise. 1 John 5 verse 14. This young man started smoking when he was 16. He quits trying to quit when he was about 28. He had smoked for 12 years, smoked about two packs a day, felt he was too weak. 1 John 5, 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him. I said, where's our confidence? Is it in your strength? No, pastor. Where's the confidence? Is it in your ability? No, pastor. This is the confidence. Where's the confidence? Read it for me, my brother. In him. Who's the him? Jesus. 
If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Does Jesus desire you to give up smoking? Yes, Pastor. So let's kneel down and pray and glass the promise of God. So we kneel down. He prays like this. Dear Lord, I'm so weak, I don't think I could ever give up. Dear Lord, uh, I'm so frail. Smoking has such a hold on me. Dear Lord, it grips me. Lord, I don't think I could ever give it up. About halfway through the prayer, I am so distressed, I shake the man. <laughs> Stop praying. He said, w w what did you say, Pastor? Stop praying. Why? Because you're going to be too so we you're going to be worse after you prayed than before. What do you mean, Pastor? You're telling God how weak you are. And who is telling you how weak you are? Is that God? No, Pastor. That's the devil. So you are praying to God and keep telling him how weak you are rather than grasping his promises, accepting him by faith and letting those promises through the Holy Spirit enter your life and change you. You're just telling me how weak you are. Have you, some of you been praying prayers like that? Telling God how weak you are? Telling God how frail you are? Telling God about all your problems? If you do that, you're going to be strangled by your problems. This man then began to pray, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I know through Christ I can give up this evil habit. This is the confidence, Jesus, I have in you, not in myself, that I, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that whatever I ask in faith, you're going to hear me. Come to Jesus with his promises. Come by faith and grasp those promises. And believe by faith that Christ will enter into your life through his Holy Spirit. Jesus is the great promise maker, but Jesus is the great promise keeper. As Paul says in Corinthians, all the promises in Christ are yes and amen. When you come to Jesus with his promise and you believe that promise by faith, he is bound to fulfill his word. Because what does Paul say in Hebrews? That there's one thing impossible for God to do, and that's impossible for God to lie. So can God lie? No. Did he promise? Yes. When I come to him with his promises, those promises enter into my life, and with the creative power of God accomplish in my life what those promises declare. Come with the promises of God. Cling to the promises of his word and watch him work miracles in your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, at times we do feel weak, but you are strong. We choose not to focus on our weakness, to focus on your strength. We come to you not having confidence in our word, but having confidence in your word. We come to you not making promises, but receiving promises. We come not telling you what we are going to do, but claiming the promises that you have made. For all of your promises are yes and amen. Oh, my Father. Fill us with your grace. Fill us with your power. Help us to trust your word and cling to your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that there's somebody here today that you're struggling with something. Grasp the promises of God's word. Come to him in faith and believe. Believe that he will never let you down. Believe that he will fulfill his promises to you. Because who is Jesus? What do the miracles of Christ tell us? What is the miracle of this woman at the issue of blood tells us? It tells us that we come to Jesus by faith and grasp his promises that he will never let us down. He is the great promise maker.